Right, well, good afternoon and welcome to uh, this afternoon's uh, Labour Leave Roundtable, focusing on what else but Brexit. Um, I'd like to introduce you to our panel. Uh, to my right is John Mills, who is a Labour donor and he's founder of Labour Leave, and he's also chair of the company JML, which he founded some years ago. And to his right is uh, Lord Glasman, otherwise known as Morris. Uh, he's the founder of Blue Labour and sits as a member of the House of Lords on the Labour benches. And then to my left is Graham Gudgeon, who is the Chief Economics Advisor at the Policy Exchange and also the founder of Briefings for Brexit. And to his left is uh, Professor Cunliffe, Philip Cunliffe from the University of Kent, who is the co-founder of the Full Brexit and a former lecturer of mine. Uh, so we're going to begin this afternoon, that. yep, sorry about that Phil, I thought I'd chuck it in. Um, this afternoon, uh, I want to focus, if I can, just to begin with, on this delay to our leaving the European Union. I mean, is it inevitable um, or should we have just gone for no deal? Uh, Morris? Yeah, so obviously I see the uh, extension as the logical result of the student politics, where when you're in difficulty you'll what you always say, Philip, they always ask for an essay extension. And that's exactly where we are now. In There's nothing um, changing. So at one level, but for those of us who support Brexit, the key thing is that, is that it mustn't be digested. You know, it's still alive. And so I supported no deal. And I, you know, leaving the single market, leaving the customs union. And, and leaving the ECJ essentially because the EU is a capitalist organisation that is hostile to the labour interest. Thank you. So that's what. Uh, Graham, how about yourself? Should we have just gone for no deal? No, uh, well, I think Theresa May famously said, <coughs> "No deal was better than a bad deal." But clearly, what her policy is and has been for a long time now is her deal with the withdrawal agreement or no Brexit, and by no Brexit you, that just means you just go for extension after extension. Of course President Macron says, you know, October is it, finally, but uh, you know, I believe that when I see it. <laughs> um, so I, I, I personally think the withdrawal agreement is so bad that, that just saying no and, and just fighting on is, 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 is the only sensible thing to do. And I can't think anybody who doesn't think the withdrawal agreement is awful, can kind of read it, mm. or, or you know, even read a good summary of it. It, it really it really is a terrible agreement. So I think we were left with no choice. We couldn't accept it, and we, 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 we need to fight on. We've got another six months now to make our case. Phil, on this, on this extension itself, I mean, was it the right decision, or should we have just, just, just gone? I think gone. Um, I think no deal was preferable to withdraw the withdrawal agreement. Um, and I, in an ideal world, the deal with the European Union would be something, um, a better deal with the European Union would be something worthwhile. But given the um, hostility to Brexit within the political class, um, just how degraded the capacity of the British civil services, its dependence on Brussels, all of these things militated against the um, likelihood of securing a good agreement, a good deal. And for that reason, I think no deal is preferable. And I think what's happening now is very similar to what happened to Greece. If we cast our minds back a few years to the Greek financial crisis, it was very similar in the um, tortuous extensions, the negotiations, the back and forth, the confusion, um, the exhaustion as well, everybody falling into exhaustion, um, and the attempt, I think, to demoralize and degrade the other side. And so, um, as Graham mentioned, I think we're likely to get an extension again in October. John, uh, you run a very large business. I mean, how's business seen this extension? Should we have just gone for no deal? What, what are your thoughts on it? Well, business isn't doing too badly. The economy is not doing too badly either. Um, I've, I've always thought that the best solution in the long term to provide some sort of stability with our relations with Europe was to have uh, uh, something like a Canada sort of type deal uh, with a free trade agreement and uh, as much cooperation as we possibly could. Uh, and I still think that would be the best outcome if we can achieve it. Uh, but I agree with the other speakers. I mean, I think the withdrawal agreement was so bad that we were right, although uh, there was an argument that this would get us over the line and so on. And, you know, I think a lot of us teetered in that case, but in the end teetered back to saying that although the preparations for no deal weren't ideal and to do it at the last minute without uh, having a year or two to get in shape wasn't the best way for handling things, 
we'd be better off with no deal than we would dragging everything on like this for another at least six months, possibly longer. Now, we're told that, of course, we're, this is all being dragged on because Parliament can't find a solution, there's an impasse, no, no sort of arrangement can be agreed. And so there is now this feeling in Parliament, particularly amongst a lot of Labour MPs, a lot of opposition MPs and some Tories, that we ought to have a second referendum to break the impasse. I mean, what are our thoughts on this? And specifically, so could someone bring in, what should Labour do? There's enormous pressures on the Labour movement to go for this second referendum. What do we think? I'm going to kick off this time with Graham. What do you think? Second referendum. Will it solve the problem? Very unlikely. I mean, it's, it may be impossible to run a second referendum. I mean, it may be boycotted formally. It may be boycotted informally. You know, say, say half the leavers said, look, we're not going to bother. You didn't believe us in the last time. We're not, we're not going to bother to vote this time. And you get a remain majority. What, what, what does anybody make of that? You know, it's, Terribly, terribly divisive. We even get a formal, formal boycott. So I, I, I'm not sure it's even possible to, to have a second referendum. I mean, clearly it's being promoted by those who just want to overturn Brexit. And um, but I, I don't worry too much in the, in the sense, you know, if it did come to a, a vote, I, I mean, the result may may well be uh, as it was before. What should Labour do? Well, I know that Labour's in a terrible shape on this. I, uh, I, I, I think we're leaving with a leader who's clearly pro-Brexit, wants out a party that no longer really represents the working class and and uh, you know, would like to, f for whatever reason, I, I don't really quite understand the reasoning and perhaps people around the table can explain this. I mean, quite why so many uh, Labour MPs and, um, and, and Labour members love the... European Union so much. I don't, I don't remember that love being expressed very much before the referendum. On the question of a referendum, is there sort of it, their legitimacy in a second referendum? Would it be democratic? We're told it's the most democratic thing to do by Remainers. Phil, what do you think on that? No, I mean, I think it's, I think the undertow is pulling us strongly towards a second referendum, um, which is, um, I think, deeply distressing and should be distressing regardless irrespective of how people voted in the last referendum because it simply means that there is uh, a deep unwillingness on the part of the political elite to enact the will of the democratic majority and that should concern everyone in the country I think um, so I don't think it would be democratic simply because um, a sec we haven't actually enacted um, the decision to leave if mm. we leave if we left the European Union and then at a subsequent dis point decided on the democratic decision to, re to go back in, that would be something else. Not having left, we've not actually enacted the earlier decision. And before we enact that decision, then any attempt to, um, any attempt to um, change our mind, so-called, is actually an attempt to subvert um, dem the democratic will in the nation. And that I think is, they've, the stakes have escalated terribly high as a result of, um, as a result of the campaign for a second referendum pushing us towards a plebiscitary model of politics, um, which is the whole, which is the direction which the European Union as a whole is also going. Thank you, Bill. Right, we've got a Labour peer and a Labour donor. Should Labour be backing a second referendum? Well, no. But just to go through it, it, you know, listening to the discussions, there will be three things that we've got to focus on first in that. The first is there's a very strong move to give the vote to 16-year-olds in the second referendum. And I've got two children, more or less, of that age in the school system, and they regularly call me aside and say, you know, Dad, you've really got to drop this Brexit thing. You know, people are going to... There's a full-scale uh, Remain propaganda going on. So 16-year-olds, having had very little experience of life, will certainly be overwhelmingly Remain. The second is there's a very big move, and it will probably go through to have EU citizens voting. So, the, the, I mean, there's a, there's a very significant democratic demographics but the third thing is I don't even think leave will be on the agenda I think it will be May's deal or remain I think that that, that is where it's going to going to go so I take the view that it's 45 years since the last referendum on the EU and, and we should wait 45 years until we make a decision on this one and, and enact it and then we can have time to judge it <laughs> you know and, and but this this can you imagine I mean, it's, you know, it's an act of the imagination. Can you imagine if Remain had won, whether there'd be even a pulse of a desire to have a... Exactly. So this is fundamentally 
liberal authoritarianism mm. in my view where they wish to actually delegitimate I mean I've done so many debates I've been accused of so many things being Putin's puppet Trump's puppet you know this that it was illegal that the vote was fundamentally illegitimate and illegal I've never known a democratic a democratic vote to be uh, so sneered at and belittled but beware where we are because um, working class support for Brexit is robust and it's not moving and they see this clearly for what it is which is the refusal of the ruling class to accept their vote mm. and so what we're looking at is, is quite a serious swing and when you come to Labour if Labour can't lead the democratic possibilities of this which is then it will swing to the right and that's my obvious fear is that that's the logic of it. John, on, on a second referendum specifically, I mean, there is enormous pressure, as we know, within the parliamentary party, from outside. I mean, electorally, just taking aside the right and wrong of having another referendum, electorally, would it serve Labour any advantage to go down this route, or would it be disastrous? Well, I think you've got to look at the numbers, and um, the numbers, uh, first of all, of MPs are probably 90% of our MPs are in favour of Remain probably 80% or something like that of Labour Party membership is, but only about 50% of traditional Labour voters uh, are in favour of uh, Remain, 50% of them roughly are in favour of Leave. So the Labour Party is on a huge dilemma, in a huge dilemma here I think. And I think one of the problems we've got is that the Labour Party has swung to being very internationalist, very well educated, very metropolitan, uh, in favour of globalisation, whereas you've got large tracts of Labour's traditional voters who have a much more nativist view of life, more concerned with local issues, with trade unionism, cooperation, all this kind of thing, uh, and the gulf is just getting wider and wider. Mm. And I think the problem about having a referendum is that uh, what will happen with the Labour Party is we'll pile up huge votes for Remain in, in London and, and maybe in Canterbury and places like this, university cities, but at the expense of marginal seats in the Midlands and the North and in Wales. And if you look at some of the numbers there, Labour has to win 45 seats to become the majority party, but 35 of those have got Leave majorities. And if you look at the most vulnerable seats that Labour is defending, if you take the top 20, 15 of them have got Leave majorities, and most of these are in the Midlands and Wales and the North, where the, we depend very heavily on working class support, which is the real danger of just evaporating. So I think the answer to your question is there are real, real dangers for Labour hugging a second referendum as being the way ahead. Well, we, we spoke about the numbers there as well, but just on this too, we've had this week the launch, of, well last week now, the launch of the Brexit party. And in the space of a week, they've <coughs> gone from being nowhere in the polls to being the lead party for the European elections. I mean, what are our thoughts on this? I mean, do the Brexit party fo pose a serious threat to Labour? Just throw it open, what do we think? Yeah, they, they, they pose a very serious threat, exactly the places. Loath, loath to uh, disagree with John, but there's one area let there is that Labour has to make the distinction between globalisation and internationalism. It, it must mm. have international solidarity with workers in other countries, with all people who are oppressed and exploited. But globalisation is exclusively on the terms of the rich. This is what globalisation means. So this distinction is vital. Um, but the Brexit party is, is, the ideological frame is completely, it's very difficult to discern. It's almost entirely negative in terms of it will capture the rage of democratic people that their vote has been disregarded. Mm -hmm. So our battle is doubled within it, within Labour. I don't think we should have anything to do with that, but we can completely understand why people vote for it. And it will be, I mean, just, you know, the level of coverage they'll get compared to, what's this new one? The Change, Change UK. Change UK, yeah. yeah I, uh, they will get 10 times their vote mm. on 10 times less coverage. Phil, the demographics, I mean, this, I mean, Essentially, I mean, I, I personally think what we're going to see, the Labour Party looked at UKIP 10 years ago and said they're racist, they're right-wing, they'll steal a couple of Tory ex-colonels and the Blue Ridge Brigade, uh, but it won't affect us. I mean, I think the same approach, if you look at some comments from MPs on social media, mm. the same narratives being thrown out, and are we going to find ourselves in a few years' time, us going, oh dear, the Brexit Party are doing rather well in seats that have traditionally been solid Labour? Um, 
I think it's. I think it, the Brexit Party probably will do will do well, and it's. Uh, it is extremely um, impressive how it stormed ahead in the polls um, in such a short time. The. I think also it's worth remembering that um, Nigel Farage has also constructed purely on the basis of a pro-democratic platform. He's got UKIP to his right now, which is more uh, more strongly based on an anti-Islam message, and therefore he has a much stronger um, much stronger credibility. To stand for um, to stand for everyone, he's not posing um, as uh, on an anti-migrant basis, but simply on a pro-Brexit basis. It's a much more positive. It's much tone more positive, in that sense, yeah. and it'll be much harder to um, because he has now UKIP to his right. It'll be much harder to um, simply to um, wipe it away as being a racist vote, um, an anti-immigrant vote, a xenophobic vote, and all the rest of it. So I think um, I think for all those reasons. It's likely to be much more, uh, much stronger than people imagine, um, and on the grounds that Morris mentioned, that despite the lack of coverage in the mainstream media, I think it will nonetheless, um, it will nonetheless do exceedingly well. Graham, well, you were nodding then. Uh, anything you'd yeah. like to add? Yeah, I don't know, but very much agree with that. Um, I was in Parliament Square on what, what should have been Brexit Day, the 29th of March, and um, just caught the end of it. And, and we were there <laughs> and uh, listened to Tommy Robinson ranting. Yeah, yeah sounded like something out of the Third Reich, you know. And I thought, God, well, the liberal elite have, have let the genie out of the bottle now. You know, they demonised Farage. He, he was terrible. And, and, and this is what you get. Uh, you know, you get someone like Tommy Robinson. So I think that Farage is doing a good job, in a sense, in, in recovering that vote and marginalising uh, yeah, UKIP. Just, just on the, the voting system uh, in European elections is quite, quite complicated. And it would be possible to split the Brexit vote. To some extent. It depends how the votes fall. Mm. Quite complex. Um, so from a pro-Brexit point of view, it would be, be better if UKIP could be marginalised down to almost nothing, really, and Farage could pick, pick up all, the, um, all of that vote. But it makes it, uh, I mean, something very akin to a referendum. If you have a Brexit party with only one policy, <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, and if it picks up, say, a third of the vote, which it might do, if it can push UKIP down, uh, down a bit more and ends up as the biggest party, what will that mean? I mean, I think that's a big sort of psychological effect. Mm. I doubt it had much effect on Theresa May because she's unaffectable in many ways. And perhaps she'll just treat it as, like, it doesn't, doesn't matter, we want to leave anyway, who cares whether mm. these people are elected or, or, or not. But turnout, sorry, final point I'd make, I, I think turnout's going to be a big problem here. I mean, yeah. Are people really going to turn out to vote, to vote for MLAs, for, for MEPs who they... I uh, think may only be there in a number of weeks or may, may never get as far as a... a Going over the channel. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the other side of the argument, though, I mean, we've got Change UK, we've got the Lib Dems and we've got the Greens. They're all polling anywhere between 5 and 10% each. I mean, are we seeing perhaps the Remain vote, if you like, splitting and, you know, fracturing? Because, it, you know, they are, all three of those parties are fairly Remain. I mean... And I think there is an element of all that. Mm. And I must say, I, I think what will happen is that you'll get more votes from the Tory party attracted to the Brexit party than you will Labour. Mm. But I think the big mistake that Labour may make is then to describe all these people as being racist and, and all this kind of thing. Driving them away. And driving them away. And that the long-term implications for the Labour party of treating people like this without respect uh, is almost the enemy. Mm. It's going to be very damaging. And I think the Labour party would be well advised to tone down all this real enthusiasm for some elements of the uh, second referendum which we've seen, which I think that going over the top like this is just going to antagonise very large sections of the traditional Labour vote on which we depend. But just to be devil ga devil's advocate for a moment, we are told and the majority of Labour members are Remain, the majority of MPs are Remain, a majority of Labour voters did vote Remain. If we go down the route, which I think we're all advocating, which is that we should oppose a second referendum, get on with a proper uh, Brexit, do we then run the risk in the Labour Party of losing the legions of Remain voters to Chuckers Mob or the Lib Dems or the Greens? No, it's what the party represents. Does the party any longer represent anything like the Labour interest? Because it cannot do that within the frame of Maastricht and then Lisbon. Mm. So that's a matter of just treaty reality. That's the um, direction it's gone. I mean, it has been an odd couple of years. I mean, everybody is kind of aware of the bizarre nature that you've got a 
remain Prime Minister leading a fundamentally Brexit party and a Brexit Labour leader leading a fundamentally remain party but the argument has to be made and hasn't been made and it's you know you've done a great job at, at Labour leave and I respect you very much but ultimately we're Democrats ultimately you do you know accept the result of a democratic vote what's extraordinary in this period are two things the first is the absolute re refusal to accept losing, mm -hmm. which is, a, as we know, a very liberal trait. They, they don't do losing very well, as you can see from Pep Guardiola last night. But, <laughs> they, you know, uh, but nonetheless, as you said, this is the reality and we have to accept it. But you haven't heard anything like that. The second is related to John's point, is that as the two years have gone on, it is more and more the case that the left have made the argument that Brexit is a racist project. So it's gone from the sort of sneery demonization to the active demonization of Brexit supporters. Mm. So um, th this, this would be, so, you know, Labour would have to, would essentially become a liberal middle class party if it, uh, uh, about, and the consequences of that, as you say, the Greens are on five and the, and change whatever they are on three. Um, yeah, but the Brexit party is going to be on 20 or 25. You know, it's a very mm. significant thing. So it all, this is, this is of, of huge import for us, how this goes. On, the, on this then, I mean, just for talking about the Labour Party becoming a Remain Liberal Party, I mean, you're in academia. Uh, what's it like? You know, I mean, they're the classic people, aren't they, really? I mean, uh, are there many Brexiteers at your university? <laughs> there, there are not. <laughs> well, what one? <laughs> there's one. There's, um, one and a half. There's more, um, there's more than one, but some of them are still in the closet. Um, <laughs> so I think, I mean, so, but, and it it's repeats across the professions more broadly, I think. The, um, the liberal professional classes are... Um, extremely enamoured of the European Union and I think it's, um, it shows it's, um, for them it's a matter of identity. It's not, ultimately, um, it's not ultimately political questions of sovereignty, control, um, accountability and government and how government is run. It's fundamentally about um, a cosmopolitan identity which they feel and they feel um, in distance from their fellow citizens and fellow voters. And I think that's the main um, the main issue with the liberal professional classes and their um, their passion for the European Union. It's become effectively an identity rather than a political a political attachment or a political um, choice, even. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, uh, on that. Sorry, Graham. Yeah. Go on. I was just saying that there, there's nothing new in that, in a sense. You know, if you go back to appeasement before the war or ban the bomb in the in the, in the 1950s. I mean, that's. All of them, in a sense, were identity projects. You know, it's it's middle class people saying we're, we're good people, we're outward looking, and, and so on. And uh, what they're very clever at is is finding bits and pieces of evidence to support their innate prejudices. You know, so quite quite good at that. But I don't know if Philip has the same experience as me. I mean, I, I, I'm at Cambridge University, but I've debated this in in Oxford as well. Vice chancellors, pro vice chancellors. They, they emphasise the big problem for Brexit has for universities, but when you challenge them, it's very, very shallow arguments. You know, they're not thinking about this. And I think because they're not being challenged, they're not sharpening up their argument. Mm. It's, it's, it's a very poor sort of experience in a way to see such, you, such senior people you know, in world-class universities really just parading their prejudices, hard, hardly, hardly much more than that. Mm. Well then, I mean, we're, we're talk moving into this now, we're talking about sort of a more middle class, Metropolitan Labour Party, we're seeing these smaller parties emerge, Brexit parties taken off quite quickly, Change UK. I mean, <coughs> are we seeing, perhaps, a realignment in British politics? Are we witnessing it? We've been talking about it for years, but are we actually now seeing it happen? Maurice, you're biting yeah, at the yeah. bit to start. Go on. It's, <coughs> just, it's just, that's this, um, also an academic in some ways, and every politics department has got a third party expert and the realignment. What was remarkable post-referendum, and remember that both parties entered the last election respecting the result of the referendum, so both parties were effectively, and the electorate in my experience, thought that Brexit had happened, that this was, and what you had immediately um, in England and in Wales was the restoration of the two party system. Extraordinary, I mean, mm. it was just Labour versus Conservative, because you could do things. And Labour ran on an election manifesto, um, which in my judgment, and a serious judgment, half of which would be illegal under EU law, 
in, in a huge array of areas from comp workers being able to buy their company mm. as a first preference would be a violation of competition law through to the um, establishment of regional banks which would be competition to other banks and therefore couldn't receive state funding uh, all the way down the line um, it was as if um, Brexit had happened so that's not where the country is at all the, the country on the whole wants a choice between uh, a Labour government and a, and a Conservative one and it expressed that in an extraordinary way the other thing is is that you would think that the Lib Dems would have flourished in this environment, yeah. but they have not flourished. You know, none of these but parties just, have made any breakthrough. But just on that, though, we have si since that high point when both the Tories and Labour were roughly on 40 points each, 38, I think, Labour peaked at, we have seen a sort of trend of both of them coming down since that. Well, have you witnessed a farce like this in your lifetime? Well, I yes, mean, I have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is what it, what there is, is a fundamental crisis of the ruling class. Mm -hmm that they are, what Philip said, they're incapable of doing it and unwilling to do it. This mm. is, but so what's right. remarkable is the resilience and the reluctance of people to embrace anything other than a parliamentary democracy mm. and an election. That, mm. You know, that's, yeah. that's where it is. So I'd, I'd be very sceptical about okay. the environment. Okay, Graham, what are you doing? Sorry, uh, sorry. So are we question. seeing <coughs> the beginning <coughs> of a realignment in British politics with the Change UK coming along, the Brexit party, or are we still in reality a two-party system? Or are we going to see a big change? What do you yeah, think? I, 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 I agree with Morris on this. I, th I think we are essentially a two-party system and, and, the, and this Bre Brexit is just a disruptive issue in the middle of it. I mean, the, if this was settled, I mean, if we could just leave and that, that was the end of it. I mean, there will be some Jacobites who fight on for the next 45 <laughs> years. But, uh, um, but for most people, it would be the end of it. Let, let's get back to the NHS and... Uh, and uh, Domestic and affairs. And I'm not, I'm not like absolutely that. sure that's Oh, right. good. Descent. Um, Carry on. <laughs> I've got a piece, a piece of paper here with uh, who was in charge of all the major democracies of the West in 2000 and who mm. was in charge in 2018. And in 2000, almost every single country was run by uh, social democrats or coalitions where they were the majority or certainly had a very large uh, sway. In 2018, apart from Spain and Portugal, absolutely none of them were. And so the thing we're looking at at the moment isn't just a British problem, no. it's a problem right across the West. And it's a problem which manifested with the election of Trump, uh, with the sort of support that you've had for parties all over Europe, uh, some of them very right wing, some of them more left wing. I think it's reflected in the troubles we've got with in this country, actually a lot more moderate parties on the whole than you've got in a lot of other places. So I think that we may be seeing much more of a fundamental realignment taking place than you, know, you do look at if you've just looked at it through a Brexit lens. Mm -hmm. Morris, we wanted to come back, I saw yeah, then I'll bring um, you in. For, yeah. I'm crucial, I mean, first of all, it really is an honour to be here with Eric Deacon, who was the pioneer of our politics in, in so many ways. But the important thing is everywhere, John, in, in Europe, that social democratic or Labour parties have adopted a pro-EU stance, they have been decimated. And it's really important to recognise this because you really can't do anything within the framework of Lisbon and Maastricht. So I'll just go through mm. um, the great Italian tradition, the Communist Party and the Socialists, w which is a kind of magnificent thing. Um, they got less than half the vote of a party whose slogan in Italian was Ma va fanculo, which I won't translate because there's <laughs> television cameras here. But um, then you've got Germany with the Social Democrats who are trailing to the AFD. In France, it's an extraordinary thing. The party of Juarez, an extraordinary party of the, of the, of, of the popular front, non-existing. Um, in in um, Holland, it's just between the Greens and the and the Christian Democrat and <laughs> in every place a popular working class right wing party which mixes sort of left wing economics with, with, with quite right wing. There is not a single example in Western Europe of a, of a Labour Party thriving or succeeding except one which was us, which <laughs> was Labour <laughs> and the reason for that was that, was that Jeremy Corbyn supported Brexit and everybody knew and, and that was widely I mean, his demeanour on the three days after the referendum is worth looking at. He looked like a pixie, you know, like, oh, 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 well, we've got to accept the result of the referendum then. <laughs> what a shame. And, um, <laughs> so the point is, this is an existential matter that is very, very specific to Western Europe. So we are alone in Western Europe in having a, 
a Labour Party that is actually challenging. Mm. But if it renounces Brexit, it will go the way of all the all the others because unless you can act, unless you have sovereignty mm. and a democratic mandate and can change things, people by working class will turn away from you because what's the point? Mm. Phil, I think um, I think we're seeing a um, a, dif a different political system trying to break through first past the post essentially. Mm. Um, and I think that's visible partly in the polling on the on the forthcoming European elections in the break for in Change UK breaking away. I think it's likely if we didn't have first past the post, I think it's likely even that perhaps Labour and um, and the Tories might both would split. I think in all likelihood. Um, but I also think realignment is maybe too narrow a word to capture ex what's happening because I think the most important shift isn't the reshuffling of, um, of voters or um, new parties, but rather it's a constitutional restructuring which um, engages all the fundamental questions of um, British nationhood and statehood, the relationship between the nations of the island, um, the question of Ireland, um, and also very fundamentally, I think, parliamentary sovereignty. And I think what's going to be the upshot of Brexit is that parliamentary sovereignty, the classical model of British government, I think has been shot to pieces and that we're paradoxically, as we re withdraw from Europe, we're moving to a much more continental system of popular sovereignty, I think, rather than um, parliamentary sovereignty. And the long term implications of that are hard to read, but I think it will probably manifest itself in new, will, will have to manifest itself in new kinds of political structures and new kinds of political institutions. And it requires political vision, I think, to grasp its possibilities as well. Yep. I think there's a fundamental issue here in economics in the sense that globalisation hasn't worked. It, 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 it hasn't increased the rate of economic growth and it's, it's been uneven and unequal. There's a need to deal with that and you can either deal with it through populism. Um, but in the US and the UK, we've got Sanders and we've got Corbyn, both, both doing, doing very well against this background. Now perhaps they won't continue but something of that sort is likely to take its place. And I, I think, in, particularly in the UK, that, that's likely to be a left-wing solution and not a, not a Farageist mm. you know, right-wing right solution. So for, for that reason, I think, although I fully accept, of course, everything John Mills says about the collapse of social democracy across Europe, there's still that problem to be solved, and it, it can best be solved from the left rather than the right, and, and we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll get there in the end. And we're in a better position in the UK to deal with that okay. than, say, in France with its particular uh, conditions. Yeah. Has anyone got any closing remarks they'd like to make? John, do you want to respond to that at all on the economics front of all this? Why we are where we are? Well, I think one of the reasons why the Social Democratic parties have done so badly is because they haven't uh, managed to achieve much in the way of economic growth. And I think mm -hmm. this has got a lot to do with the way globalisation has been organised, the impact is done, problems around the Eurozone, uh, a number of factors all come together. Um, but I mean, if you look at the position that the Labour Party is in, I mean, it seems to me that uh, if the Labour Party is going to recapture the large numbers of votes it needs to get back into government, first of all, it's got to do something on the economic growth front uh, to provide the resources. And secondly, uh, in terms of redistribution, it's got to do better than it has done. If you look at the impact of austerity policies and so on, cuts to local government and all this sort of thing, and this has primarily affected the sort of C1s and C2s and D type uh, socio-economic voters, and you know that's another really serious problem. But I think, in some ways, the biggest di the divide of all is around empathy and culture and mm. attitudes and all this sort mm. of thing. And I think the Labour Party really, really badly needs to face up to the fact that uh, just vaunting, uh, I take the point about internationalism, but globalisation and the, you know, the, the metropolitan elite, the city, uh, you know, all the things that really Macron identifies particularly, you've probably seen the, in the papers, you know, the resentment, the, the, the uh, yellow jackets that the Gilets Jaunes people have got, that, uh, you know, even what's been done with Notre Dame, with all the big luxury companies piling in loads of money, and the Gilets Jaunes say, well, what the hell about us? Mm. And you know, it's this sort of attitude right across Europe, which I think somehow the Labour Party needs to at least empathise with to a point where we're not antagonising everybody. But that seems to me to be the big danger. Mm, thank you. Any other closing comments, Phil? Yeah, I just I suppose to, um, to echo something that John just said, I think that we're likely to see unexpected eruptions in the future, something like the yellow vests, which will probably be entirely disconnected from Brexit. 
that will signal um, the breakdown of the relationship between the governing class and the electorate. And I think that's more likely to happen. But also just to um, have a positive note, because um, everybody is always disparaging um, British politics at the moment. Um, and I think, and always we're supposedly the laughing stock and we're humiliated. But that's really to say it's our um, politicians who've been humiliated mm. amongst, uh, amongst their fellow um, elites around Europe. I don't think the country or voters have been no. humiliated at all. And also I think we're in the vanguard effectively of seceding from the European Union and confronting the kinds of problems that I think all the countries of the European Union will have to confront inevitably at some point. And so to that degree, I think we're forging ahead and showing the kind, trying to overcome the difficulties that I think other countries will face. And it'll be much worse, I think, for countries of the Eurozone, for extricating yourself from the Eurozone, be much more difficult and painful and tense than simply seceding from the Union. So I think it's also worth bearing that in mind, I think, um, and bearing a kind of a positive vision in mind that we're forging ahead. And this is partly why we're experiencing the difficulties that we are. Now, before wrapping up, I'm going to invite any questions from our guests from the press here today. Uh, if anyone would like to ask any questions, please just say who you are and where you're from and go ahead. Hi, I'm Oliver Mills from the Daily Mirror. Um, coming back to the electoral threat that the Labour's Brexit position might pose, do the panel think we might see an impact in the local elections coming up? You talked a little bit about the challenge of the Brexit party. Do you think that challenge is increased when Labour selects candidates like Andrew Dobbis? Morris, go on. <laughs> yeah. So I call the House of Lords the Kingdom of Romania, you know, and, 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 and he is very much one of its uh, one of its princes. And one of the extraordinary things about this is that w when I got involved in Labour National, I come from sort of community organising a. Um, I used to get invited to all these things about how do we increase voter participation? We've really got to get people, you know, they were really worried about voter turnout. But it turns out they only want increased voter representation when they vote Liberal. They don't want actual working class and poor people to vote because the referendum was an incredibly high turnout. So what you'll see in the local elections, I mean, I've been out on the door and all I get is I'm not voting. I mean, that is a huge number of people are just What's the point of voting? That's where that's where it is. Euro elections will be. You must be joking. I mean, what? Turn up to vote for what? For that? So, you know, there's a good story th that I'd like to to tell you. It, it kind of, you know, it was it. So after the after the referendum in Parliament, honestly, I had to pretend I was really sad. <coughs> all the time because people really thought the Third Reich was on its way, it was really <laughs> terrible, it was like 1930s Berlin here, Re re and I was, you know, I was really well mannered and I really said I don't understand, it's very serious and the man walked up to me, it turned out it was uh, Lord Salisbury, who's the direct descendant of William Cecil who was the Prime Minister effectively under Elizabeth I, and he said, well, Morris, he said, when was the Reformation? <laughs> and I said, 1535, he said, that'll do, you know, it's 1537, and then he said, when was the Armada? That I knew because of bingo, 1588, so he said, very good, he said, so last time Brexit took 50 years, take it easy, you know, this, <laughs> is, this, is, a, this, is, a, this, is, a, this is what all of us have been saying, I, mean, I particularly focus on, on, on what Philip was saying, We've been infantilised to not make decisions. Parliament's been an incredible thing to witness, but suddenly they've got to actually make a decision that's real, that's not just about a short start centre or the library or the bicycle lane. Oh my God! Right, so we've got an infantilised ruling class that that is unused to making decisions. We've got a civil service totally locked in. We've got a ruling ideology totally of globalisation that Morris, there is no alternative to to the free movement of capital goods, people. Um, so all of these things, so I, I really see it as a long, so in a way what, the, what you ask is, 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 I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but people are not interested in, at this moment, in the local government and European elections and the vote out, voter, voter turnout will be despicably low and that's to be taken seriously. What turns out about uh, all this is that people actually want to vote about things that matter. That's it. Mm -hmm.
Graham? You have to say something because you're a candidate, don't you? I will, I'll, I'll bring Graham in first and then I'll make a few oh comments. Yes, except, of course, for Brendan. <laughs> <laughs> Graham. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I was uh, so pleased you mentioned Andrew Adonis. He's, 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 he's my fav favourite politician of all times. I, I, I think. I mean, he's worth a he's, he's worth a sort of cartoon strip of his own. Okay. Uh, my my favourite Adonisism was uh, was. Do you remember when Nissan said that they were they, they were going to uh, change their mind on a, 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 a new vehicle for the Sunderland plant? But they stress this has got nothing whatsoever to do with Brexit. And Andrew Adonis' reaction to that was, when Japanese people say this has nothing to do with Brexit, what they really mean <laughs> is that it has everything to do with Brexit. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> There's no answer to that at, 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 at all. Blame yeah. the but uh, ser serious and quick answer to your, your, your question, I think the local authority elections are a big, big problem for the Tories. A, lo a lot of their activists are now on a strike. Um, that they're refusing money, they're refusing to deliver leaflets, refusing to knock on, on, on doors. And the big question is, will, will even this have any impact on the, <laughs> <laughs> on the leader of their party? But as, as you perhaps know, there's a, there's a, a petition going around. I think if they can get 65 chairmen of local Tory constituencies, they, they, they have to have a special meeting uh, on this. And they were already, last time I looked, I don't know, up to 55 or something. So, um, so that, that, that's another part of this, of, of this strike. But I think just below the surface in the Tory party, I mean, there's, there's a mutiny going on of big proportions. Mm. Good. Anyway, but, but back to you. Well, no, back, back well to I'm your campaign. Just, yeah. just generally <laughs> across the country, I think the situation, the, the people that are up for election this time were last up in 2015 when Miliband was leader. Um, and of course, they're not favourable areas to Labour, but they're areas where we ought to be making, at this stage of the game, 10 years in opposition, um, enormous gains. Uh, but voter apathy and our alienation of leave voters and sort of working class voters, I think, is not going to necessarily produce the big national gains we need as much as I'd like them to. If Labour were to come out tomorrow on a much more pro-Brexit ticket, I think we'd do very well indeed in the May elections. Yeah. Uh, John? Um, well, I, and I really agree with what, what you say, and I think the danger now is that Labour will do well in the metropolitan areas where on the whole Remain support is high, but that will suffer badly in the areas of the country where you've got leave majorities. Mm. And this is, I mean, this is the dilemma the Labour Party is faced with. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah. Sorry, Katie from BBC. Um, I wonder if you think that um, Farage is actually quite a useful device in getting the Brexit that you want and how that feels with Labour supporters and then if what your concerns are going forward and what impact that might have on Labour in the long term? Uh, who wants to take that one first? I'll, I'll begin. Go on Morris. So <laughs> yeah, I, I really, really not. So just to let you know, Farage has, has made quite strong overtures to left Brexit supporters and just so you know, I'm arguing very strongly to have nothing to, to do with it. Um, ultimately, it, it is not an expression of democratic renewal and economic democracy as well has got to be a huge part of that story. Um, so what Farage is just going to pick up as ever on the uselessness of the political class and the uh, lack of any representation at all for what turns out to be somewhere between seven and a half and ten million voters who are of our way inclined so they're not being represented within the Labour Party or they're not being represented certainly not in the Conservative Party so there is a crisis of representation which he is filling and Philip is right in saying that he's being meticulous in positioning himself as a non-racist um, grouping um, but then ultimately that's not going to be part of the story. The part of it is, the, is, is that there is going to be a choice between a liberal, economic, globalising Singapore vision for Britain and a democratic socialist vision that, that will be put in front. And Farage ultimately represents that first choice in the end. It's that, so he doesn't represent the interests of working class people. But as John says, culturally, <coughs> there's a massive disaffection with with the political class which he, which he will pick up. So no, it's a false lure. And so I'm just saying it's got to be Labour ultimately that leads this. 
John, do you? I suspect in the short term that the, the Brexit Party will help Labour because I think they'll probably take more votes from the Conservatives than they will from the Labour yeah. Party. I think in the longer term, uh, the Brexit Party is much more of a threat, not least because I think the culture that it represents is one that does appeal very substantially mm. to large numbers of working class people. And this is, this is why it does, I keep repeating this really, it does seem to me so important that the Labour Party doesn't shift towards beginning to look, begin to look to most people outside the M25 as being a party which just represents the really, really uh, you know, well-educated, well-off, happy people, contented with their lot, earning well in a nice secure position, whereas they're outside and the ramparts in, in much more <coughs> shape. And, you know, I keep coming back to this, you know, if the Labour Party is going to survive in future, it's got to be able to pull all these various parts of the big tent it always was in place, otherwise it's not going to win elections. But mm. it's that part of it that's not represented. It's precisely the working class mm. conservative right. part. In, in Parliament, it's, you know, it's, it's, chronic. It's, it's only barely there at all. Okay. Philip Graham, do you have anything to add to what's been said on this at all? Mm -hmm. uh, just it would be very, very nice to see the Labour Party to get back to its roots uh, on, on mm -hmm. this, which are internationalists, but anti-EU, because we saw the EU as a protectionist racket mm -hmm. that, that didn't help emerging in poor economies. Mm. Yeah, think of the, the yeah. Labour Party, Barbara Castle and Judith Hart and Joe Lester. Hugh Gatesville, uh, Tony uh, Benn. Uh, and so oh, Joe and Corbyn. Behave. It's a minor miracle in a sense that since, to me anyway, that, uh, that since Tony Blair the Labour Party has managed to keep, keep its uh, working class vote at all. I mean, I think Tony Blair's view was they had nowhere else to go. Yeah. Well, they do have somewhere now, and the mm. party's got to sort itself out. Mm. Which I'm, I'm sure you will do. We'll try. Any <laughs> other co Yes. Um, Alessandra from the Daily Express. Um, you have all um, said, expressed concerns for the um, withdrawal agreement, the Theresa May's withdrawal agreement. Um, I'm going to take the, liber the liberty to assume that you would have rather had um, a Labour government negotiating for Brexit, for the, for the exit. Um, if we had a general election before October, do you think Jeremy Corbyn is the right man to lead the Labour Party in that general election and to, um, to get a Brexit that you want? James, go on, Morris. He's the only one because, incredibly, he's the only represents the very small fraction of the parliamentary Labour Party that is Brexit. That's the extraordinary, that's what I was alluding to, the smoke and mirrors. Without Corbyn in the leadership, this would have been an immediate cave to remain. I mean, essentially, the mood of the parliamentary party is to remain, it's, it's, to, it's to stay in. So Corbyn and John McDonnell, um, I mean, there's obviously, you know, there, there's the magnificent voting record of Dennis Skinner, which we have to, we have to acknowledge. But Corbyn is the is the only one who understands what the EU is, and what the EU is is an anti-democratic, pro-capitalist organisation. That's just what it what it is. But he has done, as John says, an extraordinary job, which is unacknowledged, of party management, yes. where he's managed to keep this together, and he's had to sacrifice leadership. Uh, domestic leadership, so he's not making the strong argument which he made at the last referendum, for example, um, for leave, and which he has made throughout his parliamentary career. So curiously, the answer is he's the only conceivable leader that we could have who could keep the coalition together. And it's still completely, Alexandra, undefined. What is a customs union rather than the customs union? What is a single market or social alignment? It's an extraordinary, so I, I give him great credit as being almost Wilsonian. And, you mm. know, Harold Wilson, you couldn't work out a single word of it. And, <laughs> and the party go, oh, okay, Harold, that'll do. And, um, and Corbyn's like that, so I'm, I'm just giving some public recognition to an extraordinarily um, besieged position that he's held and has held through this um, with a very conciliatory post, uh, relationship to the Remain part. So. The answer is, you know, I can't see any alternative to that. Mm. Mm. Gentlemen, do you have anything to add on that? Do you think Corbyn's the best one to lead us into the election and to negotiate the type of Brexit that we want? Um, I suppose I'd say I think that Corbyn has, um, I think Corbyn and McDonnell have played <coughs> an incredibly um, intricate game of brinkmanship. Mm. And I think, but they're, 
dangerously, if not already, have stepped over the line, I think, with conceding too much ground to the second referendum um, campaign already. So that's my concern, though. However, um, however politically impressive it is in terms of the fact that uh, um, somebody who's been a perennial backbench rebel has managed to keep um, the party t together. <coughs> still, I think there's, I still, uh, I think there's, um, the brinkmanship, I think, is running out of road, effectively. John, you're still a uh, very large donor to the Labour Party. Is Jeremy the man to lead us into the election and negotiate our leaving the EU? Well, I think in terms of negotiating with the, with the EU, uh, Jeremy may be in a very difficult situation. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if the Labour Party conference in September starts mandating uh, the leadership and what mm -hmm. they should do, particularly going for a second referendum with a further extension. If, if that happens, I think then uh, we're up against all the difficulties which we spent this evening describing. Um, you know, I think Jeremy Corbyn has played a, a very skillful hand up till now in keeping the Labour Party together, although I must say this hasn't done great things for his poll rating because the Labour Party doesn't look as if it's got a sort of strategic view mm. with this sort of politicking going on. Uh, but I mean, if the Labour Party becomes the governing party, it's going to have to take decisions and face up to some very awkward mm. choices. And so, so I think the danger is that these will be preempted by resolutions of conference which will mm. tie the Labour Party leadership's hands in a way which I think is probably going to be very unhelpful. Mm. So, as a Brexiteer, I wake up every morning giving thanks for Jeremy Corbyn. I, I, I have to say, I find it quite exciting that each new turn in the Brexit game, I, I, I think, how do you get out of this one? But I, I always have faith that Jeremy will. And he does. <laughs> <laughs> the, ne the next one is, what on earth could they put in a manifesto for the European elections? But J mm. J Jeremy will find, will find something. There won't be but a general election. You know, sorry, yeah, the Euro elections. I mean, but I, I, I agree with John Mills. I, I, I think the next party conference in October will be the final frontier when, when the road runs out, probably, for this. But mm. So let's hope we're out of the EU before then. Hopefully. Any more questions at all? Yeah. OK, well, thank you very much. I hope it's been uh, interesting and a useful discussion. I'd like to thank our panellists, uh, Lord Glasman, John Mills, Graham Gudgeon, and Philip Cundiff. Um, this will be going out on all our social media channels and uh, please share it and enjoy it. Thank you for coming. Thank you.